I first read about the Kayapo people in National Geographic. The story explained how this primitive indigenous group in Brazil resisted construction of a dam and reservoir on the Xingu River. The tribe had no money or industry, but they still refused to sell their piece of the Amazon rainforest. The Kayapo leaders published a letter that spoke to me as a fly fisher. It said, we do not want a single penny of your dirty money. We do not accept Belo Monte or any other dam on the Xingu. Our river does not have a price, the fish we eat do not have a price, and the happiness of our grandchildren does not have a price. I was impressed by their foresight and their courage. These brave people took a stand in the face of Brazil's insatiable appetite for electricity, lumber, and grazing land. What made the Xingu so special? I love Kenjam. I love this place of stone and of the blood run. I don't want another place. Before we settled here, everyone was afraid of the blood run. I discovered the right way down the river, the track between the rocks. I calmed down blood run and made it a place we could live. Years later, I met Rodrigo Salas, a fly fisher from Brazil who had also read the very same article. He told me what made the Xingu so special. It's a massive, clear river flowing over granite bedrock. It runs through the largest intact piece of the Amazon rainforest. It's a roadless wilderness that has been rarely visited by outsiders, and it's the best place in the world to catch a fanged predator fish called a payara. These aren't piranhas, they eat piranhas. The Kayapo revere and respect this fish above all others. In the villages along the Shingu, young men catch these fish on their path to become warriors. They use the teeth to scar their arms. This ritual gives respect to the river and allows the spirit of a fish to pass into the blood of a warrior. We are right in the southern part of the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, we are basically 600 miles southeast from Manaus. Uh, the EDD River, where we are, it's a tributary of the Xingu River, which is one of the most important tributaries of the Amazon River. So this watershed is part of the Xingu River. A fly angler at the EDD River could expect to catch at least eight to 10 different species on the fly. Using obviously different techniques, different flies, and different parts of the river. And that's what makes this place so special. And if you add that, the clear water, side fishing possibilities, and wet wading, then you start to think about a jungle fly fishing paradise. A place like this is not only physically limiting, I mean, we're about as far away from a road as you can get. It's very hard to get to, but we're in an indigenous territory and it's strictly controlled. The, the number of people that can come here is limited, so it's a select few that will ever be able to come here. And it's, it's basically by invitation only. You can't just drop in here and make your own fishing trip. You have to work with untamed angling and get one of their few spots that has been negotiated upon. And they have very short seasons, uh, not only to take advantage of the, of the good fishing, but also so there's not people tramping around all year. And so that most of the year, the Kayapo people can live the way they've always lived. And for a short window, they have visitors and they get to show them around their beautiful home and they get to benefit from it long-term. And then those people go 
home to Brazil, to Argentina, to Chile, to the United States, to Canada, and then the Kayapos have friends all over the world. My name is Ross. I'm from Pennsylvania, and uh, I make a magazine called Fly Fisherman Magazine, where we teach people about fly fishing. And my dream is to come here and to learn about the Kayapos and then to make a film that will be shown in America to show them uh, about the Kayapo people, how you're trying to preserve your land, how you're trying, how they're trying, Pukatiri is trying to preserve his culture, and about how they're trying to preserve the people here. And I want to educate Americans about Kayapos. Yeah. I think that's it. How much it's comfortable? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's 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 from Kulkuti. It's his personal one. Oh. He, he will borrow you for the week. Oh, okay. <laughs> but then after the I week, I still want to buy it. You can negotiate. He has many. He has many, many, many. Because okay. each one with different colors is a different celebration. Yeah. They use for celebration in the in the community. So back in 2012, uh, the Brazilian government opened the gates and open the possibility to the uh, natives inside their own territories to receive tourists. Obviously with a set of uh, rules and uh, a project that need to be submitted to the indigenous institution of the Brazilian government and, and, and meet uh, several requirements to make that happen. And one of the major reasons also of this project exists here, Kenjin, it is to keep the traditions of the Kayapo. As Kenjan is the most protected and isolated Kayapo village, it is the most pristine and, 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 and protected in terms of their ancient culture. Uh, the Kayapo territory, it's, it's enormous, and they have problems to protect this huge land. And the borders of the territory are the, are the, are the most uh, complicated places because they have all the people trying to enter and do illegal mining, illegal logging, and so on. People read about uh, the Amazon, read about the the natives of the Amazon, and the Kayapo certainly are the most emblematic ethnic native group in Amazon. They, they, are, they, are, they are known as the warriors of the jungle. Uh, back in 2015, National Geographic was a cover story about the Kayapos. And they, in that story, they were basically explaining how, how being brave and being a warrior uh, ethnic group was helping them to protect this, their huge territory. And they were here with, in Kenjan with some of the people that we work with. And that article uh, spread the word about the Kayapos and, 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 their, and their importance for protecting this part of the Amazon. So this kind of trip, it's not just a common jungle fishing trip. It's way more than that. It's, it's, about, it's about these people. It's about the Kayapo and how they interact with the river and the forest. We have a lodge, we have a small jungle lodge. It's, it's a long way from, from the village to the lodge. And I was eager to go fishing like right away. I was like, okay, Rodrigo, let's string up our rods, let's go fishing. And that's when I found out, no, we have a three hour boat ride, 40 miles down river to get to the lodge. 
we decided to set the lodge three hours uh, downstream from the Kenjan village uh, for two reasons. The first one is to do not be so close to the village and interfere with their day-by-day -day traditional activities. And the second one, and maybe one of the most important, we are right in the middle of the best sector of the Edidi River. Yeah? All right. right. Here, here we are. are. Let's go. Looks like a bit of a uh, tropical paradise you built here. <laughs> How old is this lodge? Uh, we built in 2016, but the cabins are new. We just built it this year. I think I, I think that's the best bet. We will explore really unfished waters. And we so really we'll enjoy the comfort tonight. Enjoy the comfort tonight. And get ready for <laughs> and get, get ready for the jungle. Get, get the next ready few for days. the real jungle for the next couple of days. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, what's the paint made of, and how do you how do you put it on? Ele está perguntando para você o que é essa pintura. He said that is a, this painting is made of chili papo fruit, oh. stains in the in the body, and charcoal. I'm too tall. She yeah. can't even reach my face. I think you need to sit down. <laughs> sit down and kneel down. Yeah. How's that? This one is a pattern depicting a boa constrictor. Painting, it's a very important part of the cultural aspects for the Kayapos. And they have different meanings. For example, they can resemble the drawing or the, or the aspect of the turtle armor. And when they paint like that, it means they get the protection or the shelter, like a turtle armor. So they can paint their bodies, resemble that. And there are other paintings that meanings have different meanings, you know. I like seeing the old traditions being practiced by the younger generation. And I like foreigners seeing our culture and telling others about it. He said, you can't smile. You can't smile. <laughs> When Pukateri founded Kenjam Village, he was looking for a way to protect his people from outside influences and to keep them safe from alcoholism, disease, and invaders. He chose a location with a granite dome so he could look out over his territory, and they settled along the Eriri River below a treacherous rapid called Blood Run. The rapid would prevent outsiders from coming down into their territory. And from Kenjam, it's a nine-day boat ride downstream to reach the Shingu River and other Kayapo villages. I grew up fishing with my grandfather in, in, in the jungle, in the Pantano Marsh, and we have been found excellent places to catch giant peacock bass in the west part of the Brazilian Amazon, 
the fresh water, Golden Dorado in Bolivia. But I was always, always fascinated about the clear waters of the Brazilian Amazon and the multi-variety species you can catch uh, with a fly rod. So I found some rivers that was really good. You can catch peacock bass, wolfish, matrincha, but they were huge rivers. You're fishing from a boat, basically. Uh, they have some small towns. They're not so good in other parts. When we, we landed here and we saw the EDD River from the plane, completely crystal clear with all the rock beds and everything, say, that's, that's the jungle fly fishing paradise. It's right here, it's right here. Oh yeah. It was one of those fishing trips that couldn't have started off better. Bam! He's got a big peacock bass, like a nice peacock bass on the line, and he's fighting it. Right under the boat. And I was like, holy crap, first cast of the whole trip, and he's already into a peacock bass. This is going to be amazing. Not bad for your first cast. Oh. By then, of course, my blood's boiling. I want to get my line in the water as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah. And my first cast of the trip, I, I had my dream fish already. I had a wolf fish on. Came back and ate it a second time. That's amazing. What a f dinosaur. Yeah. Oh. Can I hold him? Yeah, definitely. It's yours. Oh, he's got some girth here, huh? <laughs> Crazy, ugly, prehistoric jungle fish. We're loaded for bear, so many different species. Yeah. So many different flies. Come on, Jukro. Come with us. Come on, Jukro. Right. Too far right. Too far right. It was a fishing trip that couldn't start better. Both of us, first casts, big fish right by the boat. We hadn't even walked 10 steps from the boat. You have Paku, three different, at least three different species of Paku you can catch on the fly. And then we have a very sportive one that sips dry flies and runs in rapids and it jumps. That is the rubber Paku. I want. Joker, do you see anything? Ajuda, Joker. Hey. Good. Oh. <laughs> They're not monsters, <laughs> but you can see what it comes. Oh, what a battle. <laughs> you know? So that is the rubber paku? That is the rubber paku. See how it's beautiful. This fish fits mostly on alga and dries, nymphs. I think there's a temptation for visitors to get to the Amazon and say, well, here's my list of fish I want to catch. This one's number one, so let's start there. Uh, Rodrigo's first ad uh, advice when we got to the jungle is, that's not how you fish. We're going down the river when we get to a spot. If it's a good Paku spot, we fish for Paku. We move down the river, 
and we find a bank that's lined with trees hanging over the river and it's all shady, that is a matrincha spot. So we fish for a matrincha. And I think it's an important lesson for all fishermen to take what the river gives to you. You don't come there with a rigid plan and say, well, this is what I want to do because you're going to be sadly disappointed. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Rodrigo really wanted me to catch Matrincha because for him, it's his, it's his favorite fish. I mean, we've all got a sweet spot for a fish and he really wanted me to catch a big one. So we spent a lot of time wading in the river, which is one of my favorite parts of Matrincha fishing because you stay cool because you're, you're wading all the time and casting back under the shadows with small dry flies. And I can see why he likes that kind of fishing. It's light tackle. It's all surface fishing. You have to be super accurate with your casting. It's challenging. And they, it's not just the casting that's challenging. I was having trouble landing my own Matrincha. I hadn't even seen what they looked like. So when Rodrigo called and said he had a big one on the line, I got down there as soon as possible to lay eyes on one of these things. And this is, this is what makes them easy to spot in the water, huh? Yeah. Look. Definitely. It's kind of like the, uh, <laughs> it's like a perfect like your, match. <laughs> yeah, perfect match or painting. That's Definitely. why they paint themselves, maybe. It's good jungle camouflage. Yeah, man. Good. That was awesome. <laughs> the jungle finesse. But, um, people will be in there. If all the fishermen that came here would get the fish and eat them, all the fish would be gone. So catch and release is how we keep fish in the river and keep fish for our people to eat. We want to continue this initiative, keep it sustainable. Fishing is a very important thing for us. A man who knows how to fish will easily bring in food for his family. I want my son to be a good husband and bring enough food for his children. People think that you are going to any place in the Amazon, you have good fishing. And it's not like that. The Amazon is not completely virgin and intact, wherever you go. Uh, the most pristine places in the Amazon still being the indigenous territories. So uh, as fly fishermen, we look for the best places in the Amazon jungle, we, in, we found that those best, best places are inside the indigenous territories. So that's the reason we started to develop this, this model and this concept to be partnered with the natives. So this kind of trip, it's not just a common jungle fishing trip. It's way more than that. It's, it's, about, it's about these people. It's about the Kayapo and how they interact with the river and the forest. Nice. You switch to the secret fly. It is a chartreuse fly, bigger one. I started off with two rods rigged up for peacocks and wolf fish, but I kind of feel like when you're doing real jungle fishing at Ken Jam, you should probably have six rods, rods rigged up because you need one for the pakus and the riffles, the pakus in the deep, poop, slow pools. You need a matrincha rod that's just a six weight so you can throw dry flies. You need a wolf fish rod that has wire on it and a big popper. And you need a peacock bass rod because they won't, they won't take a fly with wire on it or they're very reluctant to. Uh, the tackle requirements are very demanding. 
uh, you actually need more rods than you can carry. So obviously you, you lug a lot of stuff around, you're changing flies and leaders back and forth. It's, the, the, the tackle is challenging and demanding. Yep. Yep. Strip, strip, strip. Yes. <laughs> That's a grown up fish with a mouth you can, I can yeah. get my thumb in. Yeah. Maybe. Nice and beautiful. Yeah. Healthy fish. Cutthroat trout of the Amazon. Yeah. Now you understand yeah. why we picked this place for camping? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a bad camp spot. there'd be like steam coming off of, you know, the night got so cool that the river's steaming. Well, part of living like a Kayapo and understanding their way of life is that every day they're faced with the task of bringing home something to eat. The very first big pool that we went to, there was a bunch of turtles, and it was very clear that the Kayapos wanted to stop and do some turtle hunting. Like I mentioned previously, you, you take what the river gives to you, and when you get to a spot that's loaded with turtles, you stop and go turtle hunting. In Portuguese, their common name is Tracajá. And in Kayapa, it's Crantoy. Crantoy. Crantoy, yeah. And, and the reason they're going in circles is that because they know the turtles are there and they're sort of circling, waiting for them to come up and take exactly, a breath. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And this, there's a delicacy for them. They love to eat this, this water turtles. So when they are going in some fishing expedition or hunting expedition, they know some deep pools that have plenty of these water turtles, and they stop from grab a bunch of them and bring it back to the village. You don't need a refrigerator because they live a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they have claws, and they bite really strong. <laughs> Looks like he's got an eyes on some. Yeah, the guy is, is one of the best. I guess we're not having peanut butter sandwiches for lunch. Yeah. I have many of them. Not only for eat today, but bring it back to the village. And when the warriors bring food back to the village, they are really well received, you know? And normally for the Kayapas, when the men come back to the village with food, there's a reason for celebration. So for the Kayapo in the Kayapo culture, being a warrior means you need to take care of your family. And when you go out, you need to come back with food. Vai, BK, ensina ele agora. Ensina ele. Aí, abatói. Vai, e sem go. Go, grab that one. Grab that one. <laughs> wow. 
Well, then, then Joe Crow from the back of the boat was like, hey, get Cobain up there to, to give it a try, you know? Does, does the white guy want to try? And yes, this whole trip, my answer is always yes. I, I'm only going to get one, one crack at trying to live like a Kayapo, so the answer is yes. And I thought, I was pretty sure nobody else in the group, not Rodrigo, none of the Kayapos, I was pretty sure nobody had faith that I could actually do it, but I thought I could provide a few chuckles anyways by, by making a few dives. But on my very first attempt, I saw my hands out in front of me and the turtle was like this close. And so after the, the very first dive, I, I got the idea like, I think I could do this. I mean, if you jump far enough, you can make a lot of headway and get very close to the turtle. Yeah! Hey! The baby! Yeah! Finally! I got the little guy! <laughs> well done, my friend. Well done. Not good for dinner, though, I don't think. It's beginning. Rakak, thanks for teaching me. Ele tá falando obrigado. Obrigado por você ter ensinado ele. Well done, my friend. I'm more psyched about that than catching a big wolf. <laughs> and that well is done. awesome! I came up and I was so excited because I had actually jumped off a boat, swam through the water, and got my hands on a turtle, which to me is amazing. Uh, uh, I may as well have run down an antelope uh, in Africa. I mean, there's no tools. You don't have a gun or a rod or a saw or an axe. You've got nothing. It's just you trying to dive on a wild animal and capture it. It was incredibly thrilling for me. Nice male. That is no. a gorgeous peacock. No, so nice. nice. What a grab. Nice fish. Nice male. See the hump in the head? Yeah. And I love the colors under here when he jumped. It's like a cutthroat trout. Amazing. The first thing I liked about Kui Kati was that he liked to cook. Uh, and I can totally relate to that. Like, uh, I, not, I might not be the hunter that he is, but there's nothing better on a Sunday afternoon than just grilling out in the backyard and feeding your family and seeing everyone fat and happy and saying that they enjoyed your food. It's a, not a bad way to live. No. Especially when you have plenty of food. I felt a little pressure, though. It's like, we have to catch fish or no lunch. <laughs> Definitely. It's also the way they live. Yeah. You need to catch fish, you need to hunt something, or no, no lunch, no dinner, no food. 
they just don't have a supermarket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Their supermarket are, are the jungle. But they need they need to make it work, you know. I can miss a lunch here or there, I won't miss it, but I feel like I let everyone else down. Yeah. <laughs> And as soon as he had the, the, the turtle and the, the peacock bass on the fire, I could tell that here we have a grill master. And he wasn't just doing it to get some food. He enjoyed it. So that's the first thing I had in common with Kui Kuti. My taste buds are happy. Kayapos don't have table mats, plates, or utensils. They use their fingers. Their traditional way of presenting a feast is to place the food on a bed of fresh cut leaves. That way you don't get dirt and sand in your food. Wow. Mm. Delicious, huh? Good. The turtle egg. It looks like an egg yolk. Mm. It's hard to decide what to do. It's hard. No, but we've a hundred paku feeding yeah. on the surface, yeah. or or go hunting. Or go hunting, yeah. yeah. Well, the fishing's been so amazing. I think I'd rather. Today we go hunting. Hey, uh, okay. okay. we will. Yeah. Yeah. Giant wasp nest. You see? Yeah, massive. It's massive. as big as I am. He said that the ritual of the, na the wasp's nest, the celebration and the ritual of passage to be a warrior, the young Kayapo dance all night long, and early morning they go all together to the jungle to find a wasp nest, climb in the tree, hit it, and be there, be strong. And be biting. <laughs> it's like a test of like yeah. how long you can how long you can the wasp stand that. Stings. Yeah, yeah. Did you, did he did he do it? Se fez já isso? Não, the wasp. Yeah. Um, fui bit. Duas vezes? Uma vez. Uma vez. Once. Once enough. is enough. No. <laughs> it, enough. Dois, muito dois. Dois. He said it hurts. It hurts a lot. <laughs> Muita picada tomou. É, muito. No corpo todo. Cabeça, tudo. All the body. Since our first visit here in 2013, until we made our exploratory season open to the first fly anglers, it took two years yeah. of not only negotiation with the Brazilian uh, government indigenous institution, but all back and forth with the projects and so on. Uh, but basically the Kayapos, they just said, to me, uh, if you are, if you come here to do something that will be good for us and for you, do it in the right way. You know, don't mess it up. Don't do the same that other white people uh, made on the past that they just promised good things and they just took us our forests, our fish, or our minerals. You know. And Pukatiri told me that in a private conversation. And he said, we are tired of white people giving us promises and promises and promises. So uh, this project is, is the last one that we will try. If do not work, maybe I don't know with what will happen with the, with the future of, of the Kayapos. Kenjan is the most isolated and the most protected uh, Kayapo villages in in, in the whole territory. Uh, the Kayapos, they have basically a oral yeah. culture, as many other uh, natives in the, in, the, in the rainforest, in the jungle. So if you not pass that from one generation to other, if the young Kayapos leave, and they were leaving the communities, you, you lost that connection, and you lost the whole uh, centuries and centuries of tradition and culture. So, what Pukatiri said to me is, help us to keep our young Kayapos in Kenja. And it's not about the money. 
It's, not, it's about giving them a new activity where they can be proud of what they are doing, they can be proud of their land, their river. The legacy of this project is, is to protect their culture. It's like a water fountain. Yeah. It's even it's cool. Well, if you're not interested in being deeply immersed and experiencing somebody else's culture, I think you should stay at home or get on a cruise ship. Uh, we came to the jungle with one express goal in, in mind, and that is to immerse ourselves in the jungle and the river and their culture and learn what it is they're fighting for. Uh, so we decided to be with them, learn their language as best as we could, and learn their customs as best as we could by participating. I think that's one thing fly fishermen have in diff ha ingrained in their soul, that they're, they're participants. We, we don't just stand and watch. We love getting into the river and becoming part of the cycle. And that's what the Kayapo do, and that's what we wanted to do. When we went hunting, Kui Kuti was looking primarily for taper, a large animal that looks like a cross between a wild hog and an anteater. He also got a shot at Matum, a large bird, something like a wild turkey. We didn't bring back any meat, but we found plenty to eat, including nuts, berries, and a kind of insect larva that looked and tasted like a giant wiggly maggot. It was pretty clear that in this jungle, Kui Kuti can always find food and water. That's why I walked down to that to the water because I was hoping for an anaconda. Or a wolf? Wolfish. Yeah. No, peacock bass. This looks like it's a big, giant peacock. Bill, a wolfish, peacock bass, and a ledge keel all together. There was no way in the world to cast a fly. And never in a million years did I imagine that you'd fish for peacock bass doing a bow and arrow cast, which to me is like a small stream Pennsylvania thing that you do with a size 16 dry fly. But that's the only option. Oh. Yeah! <laughs> Talk about a big fish in a small place. <laughs> Oh, what a shot. <laughs> what a cast. <laughs> that is amazing. Good, man. <laughs> what dark color for yeah, the jungle. Definitely. Huh? I didn't elbow my friend out of the way or Jones up. It's like, hey, I'm the visitor here. Can I go first? I was like, oh, hell no. You're, go you're doing that first because, ah, it looked impossible and I didn't want to be the idiot. Until, so, until I saw what he was doing, and I was like, okay, sign me up. When we first snuck up on the pool, we saw a peacock bass, a wolf fish, and an eel. We didn't want anything to do with that electric Ooh. eel. It's a nice one. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, from here. Yep. And try and grab this thing. Ah, 
Cut. <laughs> oh, that was crazy. <laughs> Oh, oh no, oh no, I have an eel. You have the electric eel. I have fished in several places where they said there's electric eels to watch out for electric eels. I obviously know what an electric eel is, but I'd never seen one. And I thought it was all like a phantom danger that you know, you'll probably never see. Next thing you know, I've, I've foul hooked an electric eel with a popper and I don't know what to do with this thing. You obviously can't grab it with pliers or bring it into the boat. Rodrigo didn't want it anywhere near the boat that we're standing in, so it was kind of a creepy situation being hooked onto something that you don't want to get near right. under any circumstances. And you can see in the water, there's at least six other ones. This kind of jungle thing happens. <laughs> I mean, they're up here in the, the moving water. Yeah. They're all, all here and they start to move and up there. I know, it was so. like uh, the head of a Medusa, <laughs> you know, yeah. with all the snakes. Yeah. It was just like, oh. It's not a place where you might see a stingray or you might see an electric eel. I mean, they are everywhere and it is a real and present danger. Ah, see, see. The clear water of the Shingu watershed makes it perfect for sight fishing. And peacock bass and wolf fish prefer to hunt in the shallows. Peacocks give themselves away with movement, but wolf fish use their camouflage to hunt. They wait for unsuspecting prey to swim nearby, and they use their short distance explosive speed to grab a hold of their prey with vicious teeth, and they swallow them whole. They feed mostly on other fish, but they'll also grab birds, insects, and other small mammals swimming in the water. They have widespread eyes set on top of their heads, and their tails are often battered from encounters with other toothy fish like bicudas and piranhas. That is amazing. Whoa. You know that prehistoric fish, Silicanto? Yeah. That's pretty much like yep. the, the wolf fish. Look yep. at that. The oldest fish in the yeah. ocean, and this could be the oldest fish in the river. In the jungle. Place is loaded well done, with my them. <laughs> I can't believe. Well done. This fish in the pocket water was amazing. Visually. And a black streamer. Yeah. Right in the face. Great. Crazy visual fishing. Yeah. And you know, people think yeah. Amazon, big muddy rivers, whatever, not like this kind of small trout streams. So. Yeah. Watch out for electric eels. Yeah. Great. That's a big one. Hook it again. That's a big one. Slam the popper. Hey, mine. Oh, that's a big oh. one. A few more yeah. jumps, you might wear them. Watch Wow. Well done, my friend. Well done. <laughs> this is crazy. This is that monster fish. Look at that. Let me try to belly him out here. Yeah. Yeah. Stop. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. Woohoo! 
<laughs> Good on that. That was crazy oh. on the popper. Crazy on the popper. Look at the distance from between his eyes. It's a whole yeah. fistful. And look at that. Swallow the popper. Look how big you got it. Whew. Amazing. But we have a lot of blood here. Tough fish. Tough fish. Tough on it. <laughs> well, well, the Kaipos are getting uh, worried. If we don't yeah. stop fishing, we are not making it back. Yeah, we're, we're light. We're light. We just need to get back. Hey, Kukuti, why up? Well, to get to Wolf Fish Creek, we had to go way downstream and drop down basically a two foot, two foot drop in the river, two or three foot rapid. We got down into water they haven't even been able to visit for two years because the rapid's very difficult to navigate, obviously. And it's easy in these big aluminum boats to drop down the rapid, but to get back up, to get back up, we have to haul these boats up through a side channel. It's the only way to these things. These things have to weigh, I don't know, 600 pounds. I mean, they're immovable immov objects. So, we're dragging them up. Dragging them up. Dragging them up. Now I know why Cooey wanted to get out of there. We could have caught two more fish, or, but if we would have, we would have been doing this in the dark. Kui Kuti had watched us fly fish for days, but what I was interested in is seeing how he fished. Like, how did he learn the river? How did he learn where the wolf fish are, where the peacock bass are, where, you know, what's going on down below the surface? So I asked him if he'd take us fishing the way he fishes, which is hand lining. Uh, so we took a variety of baits. We actually started with the very same white maggots that I had eaten in the jungle, and he used that for paku bait, caught paku, and we worked our way up the food chain, catching first paku and then corbina, and using those for bait to handline for giant catfish. And for me, the handlining was right up there with the turtle fishing. You're, you're using the most bare of tools. Like, basically, you have just a hook and a line, no rod. So it's just you and the fish. And, and the catfish in this river are enormous. He's manhandling it right now. <laughs> My bad. You got it. I heard the noise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look at the belly on that one. Oh! <laughs> Look at that. That is amazing. <laughs> Is the fish on? Yeah.
Yeah. Wow. Watch out for those teeth. <laughs> I feel sorry for any fly fisherman that looks down their nose for anyone that doesn't fish dry flies upstream only because hand lining with bait in the jungle is incredible. What up is that? It's a baby red tail. Baby red tail. Yeah, look at this. One of their sacred traditions is Kenjam, the rock above the village. Pukateri told us that he chose the site of that village because of that rock. And I knew from my discussions with Rodrigo and reading National Geographic magazine that they really loved to hike up that rock. And I felt like that's something I had in common with them because I love hiking up mountains too, and I love rock climbing. And to me, that is the most spectacular summit in the entire Amazon. And I wanted to get on top of it too. And as soon as I brought it up with Joe Crow, he seemed super excited. When you're inside the jungle, it's hard to get a perspective on what's at stake. You literally can't see the forest for the trees. When we scrambled to the top of Kenjam Rock, suddenly we weren't seeing one tree at a time. Instead, we saw Kayapo lands and a pristine jungle canopy for as far as we could see in every direction. After spending a week with the Kayapo, it, it was clear that they're really concerned about the threats to their land. I mean, that is their most valued possession above all things. They want to protect their land. But when you're down in the jungle, you, you really can't get an idea of how vast their land is. So that's why I wanted to get on top of the rock, is to stand there with Joe Crow and Kui Kuti and look over their lands and see exactly what it is they're protecting. It's no wonder Pukatiri chose this place for his people and that climbing this rock is a spiritual pilgrimage for them. When you are defending your territory, it's helpful to have a strategic vantage point. And it's important for your children and for their children to see their inheritance and draw inspiration from it. Joe Crow, he, he's very special uh, Kayapo in Kenjin because he was trained to be the person that 
register in, in photos and, and film their uh, tradition, their culture, their day-by-day -day activities. He was trained by the, their native association and some, some specialized people that was hired to train, you know, uh, handle the camera and, and, and understand how to film and take photos. He is uh, Pukatiri son. Uh, Joe Crow is an, also a natural leader for the young Kayapos. Joe Crow is the head guide for all of the Kayapo guides, so he, he, it's up to him to do a lot of the organization and leadership. He's had the most formal guide training out of all the Kayapos, so he really knows how to take care of people and he treats them like guests in the, in the jungle and on the river, and he's very careful with his guests. So I always felt really safe and secure when I was with Joe Crow, whether we were wading far, far from the boats or whether he's navigating up through the rapids. He's super capable and one of the best guides I've been with anywhere. I want my children and grandchildren to keep our culture alive. I want to see them doing what I was taught from my grandparents. We want to hunt and fish and keep our traditions alive. That's what I want to see here. Joe Crow is the future of the Kayapo people. The entire culture depends on his generation. If his generation moves to the cities and they get jobs in the mines or in the lumber camps, their way of life will be lost. Fly fishing is probably the best way to keep them on their ancestral lands in a sustainable way and still improve their quality of life. The Nishingu, we have 1,200 people that live in this river and with way more treatments than than in Kenjan. So is the future of our project with the Kaipos or the Shingu River project. So when Ross said, we are going to make this happen, I say, Ross, we have more than just Kenjan for you. We have the Shingu. We have more than the Kaipos of Kenjan. We have the Kaipos of the Shingu. And we have a really amazing species that you must experience. That's the Payata. Well, when we were at the Iriri River, there was other people who were trying to catch payara, which is pretty hard to do there because there's very few of them. But I didn't spend much time trying to do that because I knew we had the big one coming up, the Jingu River, that has big, big payara, or at least that's what Rod Rodrigo told me. So I was looking forward to getting into some big predatory fish. And my heart is just thump, thump, thumping. <laughs> yeah. I've been dreaming about getting one of these fish for years now, but it always sounded like you go to a place and it's just too hard, too impossible, because there's only like one or two fish. Yeah. That's what normally happens in most of the place. The first time that I heard about the Payara yeah. ritual here in the Shingu River with the Kayapos. Wow. That took me my attention and say, wow, that's something really, really strong. That looks, that's a powerful fish. And at the same time, made me understand many things about this, these warriors here in the Shingu River and how they are interconnected with nature. When they catch a big one, they scar their arms to prove that they have caught such a mighty yeah. fish. And when you catch a eight or a 10 or a 12 pound payara, they don't care. They want to see tep watere abatoi, which means a big toothy fish. Oh yeah. <laughs> It's a really nice one. <laughs> Have the boga? This side. That is a tank. It's like SeaWorld. 
This is the <laughs> splash zone. <laughs> splash zone. Yeah. <laughs> what the? This is a fish you want to handle carefully. <laughs> yeah, Rodrigo. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, what that is a good you. start. <laughs> what a fish. Hey, cuidado com a batida dele. What a fish. What a nice fish. Red joy, né? Red joy. Jungle fly fishing is in my veins, definitely. And I grew up catching these jungle species in Brazil. And there's so much to learn. It can be as delicate and technical as a trout dry fly fishing as you do in America, or as radical and, and, and intense as a, as a mako shark fly fishing. The, the, the hard thing with this fish is they're d down deep. So to make the proper tension to hook this fish in this full bone hard mouth is not easy. When you feel the strike and then you, you feel that if you have the fish on, you just try to raise a little bit your rod and then you release just a little bit of tension and then don't, you lose the fish. But it's, it's natural. Once you imagine that you have the fish on, you, you want to feel the action with the rod, and then suddenly you lose the fish. I'm a firm believer that most of the time it's technique, not the fly, so. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah my friend, ow, yes. ow, 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 yeah. ow, holy. Woo oh, ow, <laughs> that's a thing, no? <laughs> Welcome. Damn. Welcome to Piana Land. <laughs> Abatoy. 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 Big fish. Yeah. That fish just put a hurting on me. Holy smoke. <laughs> what about I that? I got a bruise in my ribs from the. I set the hook and went, oh! <laughs> What about that? That was vicious. Yeah. Just There's, there are still fish in fresh water that can have this such powerful take, you know? You have a little bit of everything in, in, in the jungle. Nowadays, the payara is, is my obsession. Um, I, I grew up fishing for Dorado with my grandfather. I learned about fishing with my grandfather, and Dorado was my first real Ooh. species in the jungle. Then I got obsessed about peacock bass on the fly, multi-variety species in crystal clear waters. And then uh, I started to see these amazing creatures that are the payata. And everybody that I talked with that have fished payata before have just made it with bait or lose. Yeah. And our dream is to discover and find a way to catch all these jungle species on the fly. And the last of the last challenge for me is the payata. Probably the most challenging in terms of the techniques you use, where these fish are, what's their behavior. We know just a little bit about this species. And, and it's amazing because for me, it's one of the top, of the top freshwater fish to catch on the fly in the planet. You know, Ross, there's so few people that experience this kind of fishing in terms of fly anglers, you know? Uh, jungle fly fishing is still pretty, pretty new for the majority of the fly fishermen. Peacock bass is already being famous. Dorado is on the vibe now, but you still have more than a dozen of other different species. They're amazing to catch on the fly. From a four or five way dry fly fishing for the silver pacu, or the matrincha that we caught in the Iriri River with dry flies on the shadows of the bank, up this ultimate challenge of the giant payara. Good thing we're working our way up. Working our way up the food chain. 
Tanto dessa vez. É, isso. Boa. Oh, oh. Hit him like that. Yeah. I want that hook in. Don't, don't lose tension. Don't lose tension. I will take out my line. Okay. Don't lose tension. Fish is coming up. Yes. It will run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yet. Don't hurry. <laughs> Don't want to don't want to see the light. You don't want to see the light. I don't want that light. fly to pop up and hit you in the face either. Yeah, man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All yours. I have the fish. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, there we go. Fatty yeah. fish as well. All yours. Here, <laughs> get it right. Yeah, man. Love their black tails. What a spectacular <sighs> fish. And their those big teeth just slot right in the top yeah. of their mouth, huh? Yeah. 12 pounds. Let's release this one. I get a 20 pounder though. Yeah. You know what I want to do. You will. I want to do like the Kaipo. Yeah? Yeah. Sure. If I get a 20 pounder. Hells yes. Okay. You have a companion. Yeah. You're in too? I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> 20 pounds. 20 pounds. And we'll get these Kaya guys to tradition. show us how. What a way to end the night. <laughs> Good. Yeah. And Good we made friend. a pact. Yeah. Yeah. We have. Don't deal. 20 pounds. Here you go. Te pode tire 10 kilos. Pra fazer. Riscar. Os dois. That's our goal for the next three days. Yeah. Make <laughs> New day, new flies, new hope. Okay. Yep. Yeah, stick it. Oh, yeah. Really heavy. This could be it. Qualquer momento. Vai fazer um salseiro aqui, tá? Não importa. Big old black tail. Firma. Firma com tudo. Pega agora na linha e bota pra dentro. Bota pra dentro. Bota pra dentro, Alec. Calma, pode deixar. Não. Uh! Yes! Yeah! <laughs> Look at that! That is massive. Uh! Olha lá. Olha o meu filho é seu. Look at that. Look at that monster. That's one of the most amazing fish I've ever seen. And just top to bottom. Whew. Oh my God. Heavy. What a hell of a fight. 80. 18 pounds. 18? 18 pounds. 18 and a half. 18? No. 18. 18 pounds. What a fish. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that animal. 
definitely my biggest one. Definitely my biggest wow. one. Wow. Sweet spot. What a good start of morning. Yeah, nice man. Morning. Let's do four more, thank you. Thank you very much for the photos. You're welcome. Still need the 20 pounder, but wow, wow. That's a hell of a fish. Your biggest ever, and you've caught more of these things than anyone I know. <laughs> so that's quite a benchmark. Yeah, yeah. What a nice fight. Well, not much is known about Payara. I mean, it's not a species that is talked about a whole hell of a lot, but one thing is for sure, 20 pounds is a huge benchmark. Not many people can ever get a Payara over 20 pounds. And that's the primary reason that we came to the Shingu River, because the, that's where the big ones are. We will not succeed fishing for payara at noon. They are the vampires. They like to feed at night. So the best moments for payara, it's really early in the morning, the first light, and late afternoon, almost the sunset. And that's the moment when they come from the depths and they come to the meter water column, and then we have a chance to catch them on the fly. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Fresh new spot. Showtime. Anything could happen. There it is. Yeah, that fish really messed my fly up. That looks like a strong one. Rodrigo, why do you think this river has such high numbers of payara? High numbers and big ones. Basically, it's due to the quality of water. The clear water produces a lot of biomass. A lot of small fish can eat that. So we have a lot of good bait fish in here. Whoa, it's a monster one. Is it? It is. It is a monster, on a blood monster run. one. Hey, Grant. Oh, yeah. You saw that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's your ritual fish. I think so. Ajuda também, Rio, tá? Firmar no rabo, tá? Right in the tip of his nose. Yeah. Yeah! Get in it, get in it. Get in it, get in it, get in it. Get in it. Whoa. <laughs> yeah! Abador! Fish! Woo! The vampire is in the boat! <laughs> <laughs> 
That is amazing. Look at the hook in the nose, just in the tip of the nose. Oh my God. <laughs> Batoy! It's a Batoy. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Lifetime fish right here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice open mouth. <laughs> Never have I seen a fish like that. It's real heavy. Oh, my God. Well, let's see how heavy. We're on a blood run, blood brother. Twenty-four pounds. Twenty-four pounds. Woo! Abatoy! Abatoy! Te poitire! Abatoy! That is a massive, uh, massive. Here, let me get a hand on him. <laughs> that is the fish. That is the fish. Now it's decision time, Rodrigo. You made a commitment. You were going to do like the Kaipo. This one's way over twenty pounds. It's not even close. But that's out of my life, so I will do like the capo and make the ritual, definitely. <laughs> it's a religious moment. It is. Kaipo are loving this fish. So this one's not going back. This is your ritual fish, and we'll use the teeth to cut your arm. It's their ritual. It's how they get the spirit of this fish in their blood, in their body. And they truly believe that making this ritual, they can turn in better fishermen. So, spirit of the fish enters your body and you become a better fisherman. And it's a warrior ritual. It's an amazing way to honor the fish too. And I think it's my time to do it. So the Kayapo people, they would kill the fish, but we can just take out a tooth and he'll grow a new one back like a shark? Definitely, definitely. I wanted this, this monster fish back to these waters and just take all the teeth. You're making a balance. Yeah, yeah. A balance between being a catch and release fisherman and honoring the Kayapos. Definitely. Oh. Oh my oh. gosh. Shoot. Don't lose the teeth. I see it. I see it. We're good. <laughs> no oh, excuse. That scared me. <laughs> that scared me. There he goes. Yeah! That one did a batoy! I can't believe. I'm shaking. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. That That's truly really the fish of my lifetime. You know, I have been catching big peacock bass, big alapaima, big dorado, but this kind of payada is not every day. It's not every year. It's unheard of. I have never seen anything like it. <sighs> I'd almost say I'm jealous, but I'm scared to deal with a fish like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. To get our scars, we visited Takaknetiri, the founder of Kamajam village. This old chief is nicknamed the soldier because he comes from a time when Kayapos fought deadly battles with white men and with other tribes who encroached on their lands. Now his mortal enemies are loggers, miners, and ranchers who have their eyes on Kayapo land. Ross, <laughs> Now, what do we do? 
Vai lá comer. Guerreiro, não. tradição de vocês. Ah. Aqui? Não. Take out all shirts and just make this. Step up here. Uma <laughs> Na joia curu e a curte, na gama a lenha e tomra. Rua! 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 Ah, cara, eu vou lá pro bunda lá, mano. Oh, né? Calma. Calma. Nem com nada. Ah, cara, calma, mano. How did you not scream? <laughs> I don't know. It hurts. I know, but I saw you do it and I thought, ah, oh, it's not gonna hurt. Vem cá, mano. Jenny Pop. Não. Puro com. Puro, mano. Pô. Pô, nem cá, mano. Oh, on, eh? Jungle ointment. Hey, oh, on, eh? Now we are strong warriors, strong fishermen. Thank you. And we have the spirit of the of the vampire fish of the Payana in our blood. My joy. My joy. My joy. My joy. <laughs> let's let's get a let a get a photo. What's the nurse's name? Take a photo. In the dry season of 2019, the Amazon was burning with more than 80,000 uncontrolled fires, most of them started by intentional slash and burn clearing. Since 1970, more than 70% of the Amazon rainforest in Brazil has been converted into grazing land. The Kayapos defend their lands fiercely, and the Kayapo indigenous territory today remains the largest, most pristine portion of the rainforest left in Brazil. Kayapos cannot envision a future where they become ranch hands or move to the cities. They are hunters and fishermen, and they want to stay that way to preserve their culture. They believe the way forward is to share that proud heritage with outsiders, to host catch and release fishermen who share the same love for the jungle and for the rivers within them. Through sharing, they can build a sustainable economy that isn't based on extraction and they can build alliances with people around the world who would also work to save this part of the Amazon.
Kaipos are already well known as defenders of the Amazon, but most people just don't understand why they do it. They own one of the biggest pieces of land in the Amazon, and every day they fight to keep it that way. But this fishing project is more than just saving the trees and the fish. It's a fight to save a culture. The two are tied together. If you lose the Amazon, it all goes down the drain. We need to show the Kayapos that their way of life's important, that it's worth fighting for. We need to show them they've got friends. And the best way we can do that is to go fishing with them and show them that fishing and hunting is important. And the best thing all of us can do is to pass those traditions along to all of our children. They take only what they need for today because they know the river will be there tomorrow. Let's hope it always will be. Uka. Make. Make. I thought I'd make. I thought I'd make it. Make. Thank you. Make. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.